Good afternoon. This is the JP Dinell podcast, episode 25. I am JP Dinell, and as always, I have Lucas with me. Mental toughness comes in many forms and has many components. The ones listed below are the most common and most important. Take the time to learn and understand these terms inside and out, because you're going to be seeing them a lot throughout the rest of this book. For each of these components of mental toughness, I'll first give you the Webster's Dictionary definition, and then I'll give you my own. You might have also noticed that I've capitalized mental toughness. I've personified uh, uh, personified it. Why? Because it's personal. If you build mental toughness, it will be your greatest ally in your daily battle against yourself. And if you don't have it, then you've created a powerful enemy. So the components that is listed are grit, fortitude, confidence, self-belief, self-esteem, discipline, determination, perseverance, kindness, positivity, self-love, and gratitude. And this is the very beginning uh, opening of the book. Uh, it's actually called The Book on Mental Toughness by one of my good buddies, Andy Frisella. And I wanted to dive into this uh, book just to kind of introduce it uh, to our listeners because, one, it's a it's a powerful book. I've been reading it. As soon as I got it, I started diving into it. And I just, I, I mean, I mean, I just multiple chapters a day, almost done with the book. Yeah. But also, there is a fake one on Amazon. You can only get this from Andy Frisella's website. All right. So if you're watching on YouTube, which I hope you are, and if not, just click over so you can see it. It is a very distinct looking book. It's very elegant. It is. Book. It's, I, very, I would say, it's a pretty book. Would you say elegant? I would say Fancy, elegant. Fancy. Yeah. Old school. Yeah. I like it. So anyways, the book on mental toughness by Andy Frisella. That's A-N-D-Y-F-R-I-S-E-L-L. It says his whole name on the book, the one on Amazon. The one that I got, because I was trying to prepare for this episode, is the book on mental toughness by Andy and David, which is <laughs> not, <the laughs> it's book. not, it's quite a bit thinner. Um, yeah. It's nowhere near as elegant, but it is a, a pretty, I mean, when you look at the covers, they did everything they could to uh, to rip it off. And what kind of gave me the uh um what would what would you say the the first red flag was when i read the same sentence to start out three different sections oh yeah the second was that the typeface was off pretty bad and i was like look i i don't know how to break it to jp that his buddy wrote a bad book so what i decided to do was i was going to uh, get on andy's email list mm. and just see how his emails were so i sign up for 75 hard I read one email and I'm like, not the same dude. This, <laughs> this is nowhere near near that. And when I went online and looked at the Amazon reviews, the very first one is like, this book was written by AI. This is not. It's horrible. It's not the same dude. It's absolutely it's terrible. And, and it makes me and it's mad. twenty bucks, dude. What a bunch of scumbags. Yeah, freaking scumbags out so, there. So, yep. Um. All right. So he ends that with this paragraph that I really liked. It says. Elite units like the Army Rangers have creeds that they must be able to recite from memory. What you are about to enter into now is a battle against yourself. So take a lesson from the warriors of the world and read and repeat these words and their meanings until they come as naturally to you as breathing. I'm not going to be there to check that you did it. Like everything else in this book, progress starts or stops with you. If you're ready to accept that, then let's begin. Okay, here's the introduction. I'm going to read both these pages, Do and it. then we'll open up to some thoughts, and then I have a couple other pages. Um, again, go to Andy Frisella's website, order this book. I ordered five of them, 
so that I could give them to friends. And I'm trying to figure out where the one I have for you is Lucas. <laughs> so I, you might, I just might give you this one and I'll okay, go find cool. it. Yeah. As Yours. long as you write a nice inscription about how handsome I am. And, yeah, I will. Yeah, that'd, I be, will. that'd be fantastic. Yep. I want my son to pull that off the shelf one day and be like, Dad, what's this beautiful looking book? And oh, it's got such kind words in you about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. Well, you know. When All I was right. a younger man. When I was a younger <laughs> gentleman. Introduction. You are directly responsible for the state of your life. You know, I really like that one. For sure. And it says, read that again. <laughs> <laughs> you and you alone are directly responsible for the state of your life. Not your parents, not the people you went to school with, not the weather, not celebrities, not politicians. Amen to that one. You. You and you alone are directly responsible for the state of your life. How does it feel to read that? Easy or hard? Did you nod your head and say, damn right, I'm responsible for it? Or did you find yourself thinking, but, 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 what about this? What about that? No. It's on you. And if you are the one, I'm sorry, and if you are one of those people whose brain was searching all over the place for an excuse, trying to find a reason why that statement isn't true, then you're lacking something very important in your life. You're lacking mental toughness. Mental toughness means taking responsibility for yourself and eventually other people too. It means that no matter what the circumstance, life, th no, uh, I'm sorry. It means no matter what circumstances life throws at you, you'll find a way to win. You see, you truly are directly responsible for the state of your life because while life will send you tough times and obstacles, only you can decide how you handle those moments. And what will determine how you handle them? Your mental toughness. What if the economy crashes? Your mental toughness will stop you from giving up on your business. I like that. What if you break a bone? Your mental toughness will dictate how you deal with your rehab. What if a loved one dies? Your mental toughness will make you the rock that your family re can rely on. Everything in our personal and work lives relies on mental toughness. If you don't have it, life and people will walk all over you and you'll go to your deathbed full of regret. Is that what you want? Because I don't want that for you. I want you to win. I want you to go kick butt. I want you to go to bed every night with a big smile on your face thinking, heck yeah, I really dominated today. I won. But you have to have mental toughness to get there. And this book will coach you through the process of developing it. And then it goes through part one, part two, part three. Um, and on the backside, it says mental toughness is a superpower. It's a weapon that we can build, sharpen, and use to destroy the things in our life that has held us back from fulfilling our own true potential. You want to live your life to the best of your ability, don't you? I know I do. And in recent years, I feel like I'm doing that. And the reason why is simple. I built mental toughness in this book. You'll learn how I did it and how you can do the same way. You can do it the same way. It doesn't matter where you're starting from or what you've done up to your life until now. 75 hard is a scalable program that teaches you the routines and concepts. Not every house in the world looks the same, but they're all built with the same principles. And that same is true of mental toughness. Before we get into that journey, I want you to think about one thing, something that I want you to keep in the in your mind as you read this book and then throughout your practical application of what you learn. I want you to keep asking yourself this. If not me, then who? You and you alone are directly responsible for the state of your life. You and you alone get to choose if you will be miserable or happy. You and you alone get to choose if you will live a life of wasted talent or full or a fulfilled potential. The choice is yours. The tool is mental toughness. Let's begin your journey. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? How are you doing, my man? I'm fantastic. We are we're day by day getting closer to the the debut of baby number 2. Let's go. The deuce is on his way. And so uh so lots of stuff is happening at the house and yeah I'm I'm stoked to to get to talk about this. Now I do have a, a question before we like hop into this too far. Uh Andy Frisella. Yeah. 
relation to Sal Frisella? Yep, it's his uh, brother. Okay, so that's what I was thinking. Yep. So both of these guys, super high achievers. Yep. So right? Andy Frisella started Supplement Superstores with his best friend, Chris Klein. Right. Which is on his about page, I think, yep. if you look at it. Yeah, so yeah. supplement superstores, as they're growing that, that's what prompted them to start First Form, the, right the supplement on. company. Yeah. They built First Form. They're growing. They're expanding. Sal, as he talks about in this book, uh-huh. Sal was a high-level athlete. Yep. Um, had a horrific injury. Yeah, we talked a, We uh, talked uh, around that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, just shattered his leg in he baseball. Did. I, I do have to say, and this is not about the injury, but as he's getting injured, he is still just like reaching for home plate. The injury happens, and then he like jumps back yeah. to touch home plate. Like the dude was so focused in that moment. And I know you don't like the, the videos of, of people getting hurt. That's not your bag. but Especially if it's one of my yeah, bros. Yeah, for sure. But it was it freaking a gutsy effort. Like that's, watching that happen but, is so the end of it. Very, very cool. That like, that's Sal. Focus. Yeah. That's Sal. Yeah, that's yeah. why I've always spoke very highly of them. No doubt. Um, and so Sal is Andy's brother and gotcha. Andy reached out to Sal because he was one of the top sales reps for a, um, a pretty large company, right? Like, very big company. Cru- I mean, killing it. Andy, And Chris recruited Sal to come over and help them build the company. And I mean, he, Sal is the reason why he's the CEO now. I mean, he's literally built the company from where it's from beginning until just a massive, massive billion. I think their valuation is right now near a billion, maybe. Dude, their clothes are some of the most comfortable workout clothes. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Outside of some of the origin stuff that I have, the, uh, it's all different, right? It's very, very, very different, but their, their workout shorts. And I'm really particular about my shorts, Mm -hmm. um, are amazing. Yeah. So, so yeah, that is the relationship. Yep. And he talks about Sal in this book. Um, sure. But yeah. So what what were some of the thoughts that you've had on what, what we said so far. The idea of mental toughness, I think, is one that for a lot of people is really abstract. And mm-hmm. I think that he, Sal, just like, or sorry, not Sal, Andy, in the very beginning, puts it in terms that are easy to comprehend. I was trying to keep up with that list of stuff and I got to like confidence and then fell off. Oh, I was with that talking list of, fast. Yeah, yeah, grit, fortitude, confidence, all of those things that the things that make up mental toughness, I think, are yeah. really. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of parallels between like that, like goodness, kindness, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Also the things that sort of make up the, the fruit of the spirit, yeah. that there's a lot of parallels between the mental toughness that you have to have in order to be a, a high achiever. And also that there are a lot of those things that you need to have in order to, to really be on the path and be walking with Christ as a good example there. I thought that the, the parallels between that were, were pretty yeah, fascinating. So we have grit, fortitude, mm-hmm. confidence. Yep. Self belief, yeah. All right. Yep. Um, and then we have self esteem, yeah. Discipline, yep. Determination, yep. Perseverance, yep. Kindness, yep. Positivity, yep. Self love, yeah. Gratitude, yeah. So when you look at I those, mean- <laughs> yeah. When you look at those in comparison, it's a much more comprehensive list, I think. But you, when you look at those in comparison to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control, right. Uh, self-belief, self-esteem, self-love, those things fall into several of those categories. Um, you know, discipline, self-control is discipline in the extreme form because self-control is a discipline that goes, or it is discipline in every area of your life. Mm -hmm. That whether that means like being disciplined with your tongue, with the things that you say, discipline with, uh, you're getting, you're rising and you're going to bed, which are two of the areas that I am the worst at, right? I, I'm one of those that like, you know, I, today I can get up at four and stay up until two in the morning. And then tomorrow, like, even if I've got to be up at six, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll be good. And then I'll immediately yeah. come home and want to take a four hour nap Dude, and then just ruin the rest of my day. So that's, that one's a, a tough one for me, but that's a, that's a self-control and it all, all of those things, like the ideas behind him going together, I, I thought was pretty interesting. Some of the parallels that were in that I'm, I'm fascinated by Andy's kind of like rise to, um, I don't want to say rise to stardom, but like his, his rise in the ranks, especially like in the fitness world, 75 hard kind of comes out of nowhere. 
Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's everywhere. Like before I knew you, before actually before I, I'd even heard of Jocko, I knew about 75 Heart. Yeah. And had known several people who had gone through it. You've done it at at least one. I think you've done it a couple so of I've times. Done, I've done 75 Hard, Phase 1, Phase 2, and I missed the start date for Phase 3 by one day. Oh, brutal. Which means you got to start over. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't get, I did not get to complete the whole Live Hard program, right. which is supposed to be done within a year. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's funny. It's like I yeah. posted that and it just shows you how many people missed the point. Mm-hmm. You know how many messages I got from people said, you should have just done it anyways. Nobody would have known the difference. And I'm like, that's the point. I did. Right. I knew the difference. What, what was his sentence that he told people to repeat? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it's, it, you were the one that's in control of this? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just like, it, anyways, but it just, it was just very unique how many people, but yeah, 75 hard. So Andy had a podcast called the MS CEO Project. I was on it in November of 2017. Okay. That's when I very first met him. I met, I met Sal. And then in 2018, I was doing a lot with their company. Um, and uh, it, that was right around the same time that I'd also met Origin and Jocko Fuel people and, you know, understand that they had a lot of different things going on, similar mm-hmm. world, but different things. But that's when they, I, which I thought was really cool, like, like Pete and Brian and then Andy and Sal and, you know, and then Jocko obviously is just like, dude, we're, yeah, we're, in, we're kind of in the same realm, but we're not right. in competition with each other and understanding like, Hey, if we just build friendships like everything's gonna be good. I mean, Pete's been on Andy's podcast a few times. Jocko's been on there. Yeah, you know. So it's just this understanding, like, hey, like, like we're good. Yeah, and yeah, for like me, that good. made me feel like because I felt like I was caught in the middle for a while because right. Sal is such a good friend, but then also Peter and Brian are really good friends of mine. And then obviously my loyalty to Jocko, and then I have my 100%. friendship with Andy, and I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, but it's but, the same thing that like with with Primal Beef, right? Oh that, yeah, yeah. Like those yeah. guys are in. Uh, in a certain way, like direct competition with Little Cattle Co. Yet when you guys were talking about starting Little Cattle Co., who were some of the first guys that called to try to help you guys out? The dudes from Primal Beef. Yeah, well, they were just in the process, but also another one that wasn't even connected to us at all. And yeah. that was because my relationship with Sean Glass, who's a former team guy, and right. Jocko's a part of that. But the other one I don't even think I've told you about was Colorado Craft. When I okay. first was on Jocko's podcast, Colorado Craft Beef they reach out to me on Instagram like, Hey, if there's anything we can do to help you, let me know. That's and I'm so like, cool. What? And then even one of my old customers or one of my old clients at Echelon Front, Agarby, Snake River Farms, mm-hmm. I've done a lot of work with them and some of their leadership had reached out to me like, Hey man, it's a, it's a cutthroat industry. It's like us versus the big boys. If there's anything we can do to help you, let us know. And I'm that's like, so awesome. This is unreal. And, and so that's what I've seen that, but that's the difference. These are all successful companies that have integrity. Yep. And and that's what Andy's big thing. If you think about what mental t- to me mental toughness is rooted in integrity. It's the integrity that you hold with yourself. Yep. And that's what you have that's why, you know, Jocko told me in dis- uh January of 2020, um, it's just crazy to think that was over 4 years ago. Bro, discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. Yep. And that's an integrity. That's a, that's the the integrity that you maintain with yourself in regards to what are your goals? What are your dreams? What are your ambitions? What are you supposed to be doing? And I told you, like, you asked me, like, Hey, how was today? And I was like, yeah, I didn't get much done today. And I know that's good once in a while to have those days, those days that you can kind of, you know, not be, you know, going, going, going nonstop. Like it's good for you. You need that. But I just felt, I don't know. I felt guilty because I felt like I should have done more. And I think that as I've been reading this book and diving deeper into it, there is this self accountability that I have of like, Hey man, like you need to be, you need to be doing these things. And, and, and again, that comes down to integrity. It's like, Hey, you know, you're supposed to be doing the right things, do the right things. Um, yeah. that's what I've really been getting out of this book. Yeah, for sure. And that flies right in the face of the people who were like, <laughs> you should have just not said anything to anybody and, and gone about it, which that, that is, I mean, that's the, the antithesis of what he's talking about. That is the, the absolute like, oh, this completely went over your head. You know, it's funny that you're talking about in, I say it's funny, it, it's appropriate that you're talking about integrity. I I was reading uh, this book, Leadership Strategy and, and Tactics. tactics oh. I think is what it's called. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and in in part two, where uh, 
the the author um, is talking about oh, that, 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 that Jocko Willing guy. I think so. that's not what <laughs> Pierce Morgan called him, but <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So when when he start when he's talking about becoming a leader, he has this list of like twelve things that you have to do. This is literally what I was reading this morning. Uh, number eight: have integrity. Do what you say. Say what you do. Don't lie up or down the chain of command. That is number eight, right smack in the middle of this. And then he says, um, these rules are straightforward. They make sense on paper, but they're hard to implement. Look at them in the morning, before meetings, when you're about to make things happen. Review them before you go to sleep at night. Soon they'll become second nature. But if you find yourself struggling, pause. Read these rules again and ensure that you're following them. Integrity is of the utmost importance for anyone who is looking to not just start a business, anybody that's looking to lead, anybody that's looking to make an impact in the lives of the people around them, in the lives of their kids, in the lives of their spouse, if you don't have integrity, if you can't stand on your word, then you have nothing. Yeah. Again, to me, mental toughness is rooted in the integrity we maintain within ourselves. So just something to think about as we dive into this. Um, All right, so on chapter one, uh, he says, again, get the book. I'm just doing highlights of some of the stuff. But every one of us is only as strong or as weak as our routines. And with a thousand-day sample size, you can easily see those routines at both the micro and macro level. By looking at your last 1,000 days, you and I can see the answers to the questions like, how are you spending your time? Where are you spending your time? Who are you hanging out with? What are you reading? What skills are you learning? What work are you doing? How much sleep did you get? How are you exercising? What does your diet look like? Do you exercise on a daily basis? Do you have short-term goals? Do you have long-term strategy? Do you drink water or sugars? Do you do deadlifts or drugs? Do you have a life or a addiction? i bleep that out for the kids. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have a gym membership or a fast food loyalty card? Oh, my <laughs> gosh, bro. <laughs> what if you have both? Is, like, is that okay, Andy? No. No, it's not. <laughs> Andy, just drop. leave us a comment if that's okay. Are you educating yourself by watching documentaries or watching reality TV? Do you get outdoors or are you... Are you starting to become a part of your furniture do you want others to win or do you talk crap and get jealous that's a good one do you give back to others do you go to bed at night knowing that you killed it or do you lie there full of anxiety thinking to yourself dang i wasted my day have you ever even asked yourself those questions sometimes it's not easy to do It means looking at ourselves and our lives in the mirror. When you don't like what you see, that's hard. And if you're being honest with yourself, truly honest, um, those answers can be brutal. It can seem like a uh, a monumental uh, task to turn your life around, but the reality is it can be done as long as you follow the right steps and then keep following them one foot in front of the other over and over and over. And then goes on to say some other stuff, which is awesome. That's why you need to get the book. Let me make this as clear as I can, because this is the foundation of everything in this book. Your routines equal who you are. What you got on that? what you think? I don't like my last thousand days. That's what I, that's what I think. Same. Yeah. And I I'm, think it's, I'm not too thrilled. So when you look at your last thousand days, it's essentially like your last three years. And I think for so many of us, our last three years are laden Gone. with excuses. Go- oh. Right? Because we've got we've got the COVID excuse, right? <laughs> yeah. Because that that yeah. changed a lot of things that we that we did or were able to do. So, you know, now three years is going back to twenty twenty one. But you can still be like, well, we were coming off of COVID or the company's coming off of COVID or we didn't know and supply chain and blah, blah, blah. There's there's the COVID excuse. And depending that, on where you live in the United States, a lot of you are still stuck in that. Stuff. Oh, yeah. Right. It's hard and, for us to relate to that in Texas, but other like up in the Northeast or out, out West. Yeah. Or up in like 
I mean, think about it. All the, the cities that are ran by a certain unique group that are very controlling and have high uh, violence and gun related activities. Yep. <clears throat> you can figure that one out on your own. Yeah. Um, that's weird. They all had the lockdowns and all these issues. It, it wasn't that weird if you could recognize patterns, but that's for you Mensa people out there. That's not us. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, but you, you do, you have the COVID excuse for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, working with students in particular, like the COVID excuse is a huge one for the, uh, the school districts. I don't know how many teachers that we've talked to, how many people that uh, work for school districts and you were talking about the, the struggles our, our buddy over at Semper Sometimes yeah. is talking on his podcast about how difficult it is for them to get people into the Marines as a Marine recruiter because the kids can't read. They can't pass the tests. Right, they literally cannot read in order to pass the test because they've got elementary school reading levels. And then when we talk to administrators about, you know, is this something you're seeing in your schools? And they're like, yeah, we have to pass kids, but COVID shuts so many things down. So COVID is an excuse for a lot of folks. COVID is an excuse for a lot of administrations. It's an excuse for our students. Yeah, that's all happened within the last three years. Right, uh, your life changes. I got married. I've had a kid. We've got another kid on the way. You know, my my oldest son spent two months in the NICU, mm. right? Those those are all milestones of my life, but they're also things that I could point to and be like, oh, this is why this didn't happen. This is why this didn't happen. This is why this didn't happen. And just in the the introduction of Andy's book, I'm looking at my, my life over the last three years and I'm like, oh, cool. I've used all of these amazing things that have happened in my life as excuses for me not to take better care of myself and be prepared to be able to take care of these people later in my life. So, um, so far, Andy's a jerk. <laughs> That's his first impressions. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> part of being mentally tough means thinking for yourself. I like that. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the things that we teach at Echelon Front is to teach people how to think, not what to think. Mm -hmm. And that was a critical thing in the SEAL teams was having the ability to think on your own, to be able to make decisions, to be able to make like high level decisions and calls, especially when you're in combat. I mean, you're making calls potentially where nobody's going to push back. Nobody's going to question it because you're the only one out there. You're, you're the one in the middle of it. And they're going to be like, okay, Roger that because you're higher ups are trusting you and yeah. you have to be able to instill that into your, I mean, it's incredible when you think about the amount of trust and responsibility Jocko and Seth gave me in Ramadi, acting as our leading petty officer uh, in charge of our group, our, as our lead sniper, as our point man, you know, I'm creating the routes, I'm, I'm creating all these plans, I'm going and briefing other high-ranking military officers, and they're trusting that what I say is going to be good to go, yeah. because we're the subject matter experts in these things, and, and to be honest, we were. We were the subject matter experts. And there's times that we also were trusting these soldiers and trusting these Marines that we were working with and and just understanding like, hey, they've been trained to be able to make these hard decisions. And and I love that being part of mentally tough means thinking for yourself, knowing what you need to do. Nobody else is gonna do it for you. Now I can hire a coach. I can, you know, and I've done that before because I want to follow their plans and I know that their workout plans are going to be better than mine. Now I know what to do, but I also know that there's better ways of training. There's more research. There's, you know, there's just better things out there. And so sure. that's why I'll buy Justin's programs and I'll buy other people's programs. And I follow what uh, Justin at 360 fitness does. And I follow Jason Kalipa and you know, all these yeah, different, he knows a little something. yeah, all those, <laughs> you know, those different friends that I have um, just to kind of like pick their brains and, you know, Josh Bridges, you know, I'll get some of his programs and Derek Wida, you know, I'll do it to support their business, but also, because I like to see the different things out there, but ultimately, when I read that, being part of part of being mentally tough means thinking for yourself. It means I have to do the work. I have to execute. Like we talk about on the OODA loop, I have to take action. Being mentally tough means that you're going to take action. You're going to take action to do the hard things in your life that you don't want to do. Yesterday. Train jujitsu twice, once in the morning at 630 and then in the evening. I didn't want to do the evening class. Full disclosure, 
brought my stuff, packed my stuff because I knew I'd kind of mm-hmm. paint myself into a corner. And then, you know, I just figured, okay, cool. Kids will train. Core wants to do the adult class. We'll let her do the adult class and, and then we'll be fine. And then you surprised me and you showed up and there's a bunch of other people. You surprised that were me there. when you showed up. I was supposed to be the beginner class. Not this open mat nonsense that I got stuck in the middle of and get smashed. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> but did you learn something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. So and I was able to implement it like that night. There we go. Let's go. It was good. Um, but last night was one of those nights where it's like I knew that I needed to train. I yeah. didn't want to, but I knew. And I and my buddy uh, Ryan Kramer was there, and he was he's like, oh, these double days are gonna kill me. He's like, it's a bad choice, you know. Just joking about how we're getting older and not able to do it like we were being younger. But I look at Ryan Kramer as one of those mentally tough guys. You know, he works oh, out sure. every morning, early in the morning. He, he takes really good sh- care uh, of himself. He's healthy, trains in the mornings, and then he'll do noon classes and evening classes when he can. And so I was like, okay, cool. So Ryan Kramer's there training. You're mm-hmm. there. I know what I need to do. So last night I just made the decision. Cool. I'm going to train and I'm going to train hard. Yeah. And I had really hard rounds. Like almost all my rounds were like really, really hard rounds. The first one was not. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good, it was a good round with you. I enjoyed it. I just, I also know it was not your hardest run by far. You were not my hardest round. No, uh-uh. And that would be a pro- like no offense to you. Oh yeah, if a white belt is coming in with a purple belt and former Navy SEAL, and I'm I'm a problematic round for you, then uh, Professor Formiga needs to have a, a yeah. private set aside chat with you. Yes, right. Yeah, <laughs> compared to the other purple belt that I rolled with at the very end, my yeah. last round, who's, who's a monster, ov- well over three hundred pounds, yep. and is a purple belt with multiple stripes. You're like, yeah. I remember at the and very fantastic end, fantastic mustache, and I was. <laughs> Yeah, I just remember like sitting there and again, coming down to this mental toughness. I, I'm glad that I've read this book and you know what we teach at Echelon Front. It's just this really good base and foundation for doing the hard things, yeah. doing what you're supposed to do. And I remember standing there and it's the very last round and I hadn't been part up with any partnered up with anybody and I'm looking and he has no partner and I just look at him and I'm like, you want to go? He goes, okay. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? And I had multiple people <laughs> tell me, like, hey, bro, be careful. Hey, don't do this. Hey, be careful uh-huh. of this, this, this. Because I know he's a very good dude. He's a lot bigger than me, a lot stronger than me. And it was he's a got great wrestling. It was, yeah, yeah. high level wrestler and yep. a judo guy. And I'm like, what mm-hmm. could possibly <laughs> go wrong for me in this one? Um, but again, do the hard things. Yeah. It's your choice nobody made and that's what i loved about last night is usually for me it partners up everybody victoria last right. night was just letting everybody pick their partners yeah uh, when you said hey let's go i was like this is a bad idea <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you took us to the old man mats and i was like okay this is fine <laughs> if i need more space i'll just try to sink in lower into just, the cushion <laughs> just go 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 um but it was it was it was awesome knowing that I chose that round. Yeah. I chose, you know, the same thing with Isaac. When I had a round with Isaac mm-hmm. the other morning, I was like, oh, dude, this he's is a monster. It, he is a monster. Yeah. And he he's also a very good friend because if he went 100% against me, he would hurt me. Yeah. And oh, he knows the that. potential for that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Well, the potential is very, very right. high. Um, and so that's why I have to just fight grips and almost go into like a panic mode when I roll with Isaac. I'm oh, just for like, sure. oh, I'm not letting you get anything and just make him get tired from getting grips. And then he pulls and then he ends up sweeping me and just murdering me. But I yeah. delay it as long as possible. Isaac reminds me a lot of my twin Echo Charles. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Also, um, I have a beef with Isaac's coach, David. Oh, yeah. If you're listening to this, David, um, you're on why? Wh- what? I said David's on notice. Yeah. Why does Isaac not have his brown belt? You're a jerk. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I just, that's how you put your okay, hit. Yeah, yeah, I just put a hit out on myself. You just put, it, put yourself on blast there. <sighs> I do. I do. I do. Okay. okay. So I've, I've got a question about this before we move on to the next topic, right? So if we're talking about thinking for ourselves, Yep. This is something that you guys had to do in the SEAL teams. It's something... All the time. All the time. Right? It, it is one of those things that, that Jocko preaches. If you go back as uh, as he has encouraged so many people who listen to his podcast to do, 
read the writings of Colonel David Hackworth. It is something yep. that he is huge about. Um, going back to World War II, Robert Leckie talking about how much that changed the Battle of Guadalcanal when they allowed the soldiers, the Marines who were there, to think for themselves. How do you teach somebody to think for themselves? Because that seems to be a daunting task. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I don't know. No, but, but like, no, no, no. I mean, that's the that's the yeah. typical answer, right? I don't know. Yeah, but right? I'm asking you, like, if you were to teach somebody how to think on their own, what do you think you should do? There has to be a training portion of it, right? But I think most of it, from my perspective, would be asking them questions as you're walking similar them through to something. Asking them questions similar to what do you think? Yes. Like that. Exactly. Right? And one of my favorite ones, uh, Sean McDowell, who his dad, Josh McDowell, wrote uh, Evidence Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Sean McDowell's a a brilliant apologist and professor at Biola University. He works with uh, college students, and one of the things that he gets a lot is people saying, I don't know. And he goes, well, what would you say if you if you did know, if you were somebody that did know, what would you say? Mm. And he says for a lot of the kids in Gen Z and Gen Alpha, that they immediately like, they know what somebody that was an expert would say, but they don't, they don't know their own. All right. So there you go. That's part of it. Thanks for that example. You're welcome. What next? (laughs) (laughs) I did that recently at a workshop. Yeah. And the guy goes, huh? I see what you just did there. <laughs> and, and, you think you know, you're so there's, smart. And there's obviously a lot more. There's a lot more sure. that you can dive into, but that's the base is is asking your, your people, hey, what do you think? And then if they do say, well, I don't know, something similar to that example, like the, what I would typically do with like Cody and guys in the FTX program is, you know, if they would say, well, I don't know, my response is, to them would be like, okay, well, that's that's fair, but I, I'm i willing to bet that you do know. If you couldn't get a hold of me and had to make a decision right now, if I wasn't here, what would you do in this situation, knowing that this is what we're trying to accomplish? How would you get, how would you get yourself there? Yeah. And honestly, 95% of the time, their answers are where they should be. Because if you're working with somebody who's somewhat educated, and I, when I say educated, I don't mean like education, but I'm talking right. like, are they somewhat intelligent? Do they read books? Do they pay attention? You know, are they doing research? Are they are they are they aware of what's going on around uh, around you? You know, and so, I mean, and even from that statement, there's so many different layers and rabbit holes we can go down to like, well, what if your people are educated? What if you have the bottom of the barrel? What if you have the, okay, cool. We can work down that eventually one day. I'm talking about the average person in the workforce, the average person on your team. If, if they haven't developed or they're just scared to make decisions on their own because they're afraid of making a decision and they'd rather for you just to give them the answer and tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. The, the easiest thing is I would say, Hey Lucas, well, you know, based off of what we're trying to accomplish, this is what we need to do. And remember, this is why, how do you want to get the job done? Yeah. What, what's your game plan? What do you want to be able to do to, to accomplish this? And I'm going to sit and have a conversation. And if you're like, well, I have no idea. I'll be like, okay, well, let's start from the base. We know that we have to accomplish X. We have these resources. This is what you're capable of based off the capabilities that you have and the resources you have access to, what is the first small decision you can make that gets us in that direction? Not across the finish line, but in in that direction. What's a small right. step that we could take? And I'm going to do that. I'm going to build your confidence by making small iterative decisions. I'm going to help you make small iterative decisions, ultimately by asking you questions, maybe giving suggestions, be like, hey, if you were to you know, be inserted by Humvees up to point alpha, does that help you carry more gear so that you can actually set up a longer overwatch? And you say, well, yeah, that actually does make sense because I just reduced your distance traveled by three quarters. So instead of traveling in, you know, 10 miles, right? you only have to walk two and a half miles. Could you walk two and a half miles with this extra gear? 
And you're like, well, yeah, I think we're capable. Of that. That's a okay, much more awesome. doable thing. So, yeah. so we want to include vehicles into your plan up to this point. This reduces three quarters of your travel time uh, on foot. So you can do that on vehicles. Knowing that you can now carry all this extra gear, which of these buildings do you think would be best to set up that allows you to set up two locations that provide mutually uh, supporting fields of fire and over uh, mutually overlapping fields of fire to support each other. So you have two groups. They're going to be set up in two different buildings. We want to be able to see each other. We want to have overlapping fields of fire. Which of these two buildings, Lucas, do you think is going to be the best to be able to do that? And I might even point at the two buildings that I know is best, but I'm sitting here talking with you and, and you pick the two right buildings. I'm like, man, I really like that. That's, those are really good buildings. Okay. We know the soldiers are coming in. They're going to be doing this clearance. This is about the time frame that they're going to be doing the clearance. The gear that you have with you, does that give you enough time to be out in the field knowing that something could go wrong and you have to stay out there for an extra 24 to 36 hours? Do you have enough water and food to be able to do that now? Yep. Okay, cool. So is this plan doable? Can, can, we, can you and your fire teams come up with a more detailed plan in regards to who goes in what buildings, how you guys are set up, what weapons you're bringing, what gear you're bringing and get back to me in the next hour or two. So I can brief, you know, the Colonel on this plan. And you're like, yeah, I could do that. Now, did that take me a little bit longer than me just saying, Hey, this is what you're going to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. But I'm guiding you along the way. I'm giving you, I'm giving you examples that I know that at work so that you can see it and boom. And and I'm also giving you ownership by asking you questions like, Hey, what do you think about this? Would this work? Hey, you know what? Actually, yeah, I like your idea, Lucas. I'm, I'm, I'm coaching you along the way and I'm teaching you how to think. So that way, the next time you have a mission that's similar to this, I give you the parameters with a little more details. And I say, all right, Lucas, this is going to be very similar to the last time that you guys set up a 72 hour overwatch with the potential of it going an extra 24 to 36 hours. We actually do have Humvees like the last time. Let me know how you guys want to get this job done. If you can get that brief uh, to me in, in an hour and a half, that would be ideal. I've got to right. go to this other meeting. You've already done this before. So what's the likelihood that you're going to come up with a somewhat decent plan again? Pretty high. It's higher than it was before, correct? R right, yeah. It's definitely increased. It's increased from you saying, I don't know. Yes. Okay. So I took the time of the first time and now I can boom, give you your plan. You brief me your plan. We make little tweaks to it by me asking you questions, or it might be a good enough plan that I'm like, Hey, you know what? Lucas and his guys, they can go execute right now. And by you executing right now, it gives me, you know, I have confidence in your plan. So I allow you to execute that plan. And what does that give me? It gives me more time to be strategic and detached and, and pulled away. Um, and it's, as a leader, if you're helping your people develop mental toughness, you have to put them in situations that they're going to struggle. You have to put them in hard, hard training, and you have to allow them to make decisions. You have to let them fail in a controlled environment. You have to debrief it. You have to talk about it, and you have to teach your people how to think. You have to. You absolutely have to do that. Okay, so listening to that and – and realizing like the importance of all of those things, especially as it comes to not just decentralized command, but like from the top down when you're looking at the laws of combat, like people need to be able to think for themselves within cover and move. They need to be able to think for themselves within simplify because they have to be able to think about the best way to have, you know, simple, clear, concise communication yep. and on and on it goes, right? My first question that comes out of that is how long do you wait whenever you ask a question? So like in a classroom setting, the, the standard that's being taught is, you know, if I ask uh, a question to a class full of people, then I wait 12 seconds before I get an answer. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get an answer, then what I'm supposed to do according to um, like the, the, the way that we're, we're taught to teach essentially, right? Or the way that teachers are taught to teach. After 12 seconds, if you don't get an answer, then you need to determine whether or not you asked a clear question. That's good. All right? So if you're asking questions to your people and you're consistently getting blank stares, I think from my own experience, my tendency is to try to help them come up with the answer. 
right? How yeah. long should I wait? How long should I let them steep in that silence mm-hmm. before I reevaluate or before I, I hop in and give more guidance? What's the, what's the so right thing to do there? I'm gonna, it's awkward. Yeah. I'm going to have the readback actually established into the culture of my group. Okay. Meaning my group is going to know when I get done with a brief, I'm calling up upon a few of them to read back to me what we just talked about. Okay. So they're already waiting. And I have people that like, they're ready to read it back to me. And that eliminates the no question thing mm-hmm. for the most part. I can't say a hundred percent, but for the most part, it eliminates not people not asking questions. Cause if I, and this is what we teach at Echelon Front, it's called right. a read back and it, it allows you to have alignment. This is a tool that gives you alignment with your people. And so I'm going to establish that into the culture of my organization. And my people are going to know when we get done with the brief, I'm asking for a few people to brief it back to me. And so when I get done with that, um, I'll just, I'll call upon a few random people or what I'll, what I'll do eventually is I'll say, all right, guys, who wants to read the plan back to me? And then I'll have a few people that are going to brief it back to me. And if nobody raises their hands, I'll say, all right, Lucas, I need uh, I need you to help me out, bud. Can you come up here and brief back to me what we just talked about and what the plan is? Do you have any questions before we get started? And then now you might have some actual questions or you might be like, nope, huh. good to go. And you bring your notepad up and you brief back to me what we talked about. I'm like, cool, awesome. And if there's any corrections that need to be made, guess what? You're prepped. I make it right then and there. Yeah. Instead of you going off to start your work day thinking you have the right plan and then you go out and do the wrong thing. I was uh I had a construction company reach out to me about eighteen months ago, uh, the day after I did my workshop with them and they said, Hey, that readback thing that you taught us saved us a couple hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. And I'm like, Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, can you elaborate a little bit right. on that? And the guy said, Yeah. He's like, so I implemented the readback with my team, like you told me to, like how you taught us to. And he said, I ha- I called one of my foremen up front to brief back to me what what their plan was, and the the guy's plan, if he would have went and executed on his plan, he said it would have cost him a, a couple hundred thousand dollars in rework. Good grief! And he said, thank you. That was well worth the investment of yeah, the no training doubt. with you guys. And what I didn't know is that most big commercial construction companies they um they budget for hundreds of thousands of dollars of rework on these big multi-million dollar projects Mm -hmm. because they just know people are going to make mistakes and they're going to have to fix it yeah kept in touch with that company and they the guy the superintendent and a lot of the other people on that in that crew uh that was a part of the training they made the reback a part of their culture like he said for him he was like it was a non-negotiable because we saw the value of it after that very first time and he goes i knew that as a leader i had to maintain that because it's going to keep my people safer it's going to make us more efficient more effective and it's going to give us alignment at the end of the day have you ever have you ever had too much alignment with people no no nobody ever has yeah so the reback is a tool that allows you to work through this it's awesome It's a great thing. And uh, so when they finish that big project, do you think they're ahead of schedule or behind schedule? It seems like they would be ahead of schedule. They were ahead of schedule. And how do you think they were on their budget, above or below? Probably below. They were massively below their budget. And how do you think that affected his guys with their bonuses? Oh, I mean, tremendous, right? So that's a way of also taking care of your people because they're part of their um, compensation plan was – based around the budget of those projects. Yeah, it's schedule and overages, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just by him implementing the reback, he was able to get his guys paid more. He saved the company money. He, I mean, he made his company more money. Mm-hmm. And I mean, now they're they're safer. Their safety scores are better than they've ever been. And do you think that affects their insurance in a positive manner? Oh, it has to. Yeah, so it lowers their insurance as well. I mean, the read means there's more money in the pool in the beginning. Yep. There right? you go. Yeah. To start with. Yeah. So when you're implementing something like a read back in, um, in a, a decentralized command environment. Yep. So you've given like, let's, let's roll back through the scenario, right? You've given me all the details that I need for the mission. I gave you the what and the why, and right. I let you create the how. Okay. So now I'm stuck on the how. Okay. You've asked me a question about the how I'm stuck on the how, how long do you wait before you interject? Or do you point me, do you start asking questions about the details that you've already given me, mm-hmm. you know, using that kind of going back to the readback format, using the details that you've already given me, 
reminding me of those things in order to help me implement yeah. what's going forward. So there's, How does that work? there's two phases here. One, the readback is going to be immediately after any and every type of meeting. Right. Safety any call, yeah, any yeah. brief, any meeting, any safety meeting, plan of the day. It doesn't matter. We get done with it. And the first time you do it, you want to tell your people ahead of time. So I would, if, if I'm sitting with my group, I'd say, hey, guys, I just got back from this training. Um and, you know, I have a handful of takeaways that I look forward to, te- uh, you know, sharing with you guys. One of the takeaways is called a readback. It's a tool that's going to help us maintain alignment. And it's going to be a tool that helps me communicate better with you guys. It's something I've been trying to focus on. I want to improve my communication with you guys so I could use your help. Yeah. Whenever we get done with a brief, a meeting, a safety meeting, a plan of the day, it doesn't matter. Anything, anytime we get done with a little meeting, I'm going to have a few of you brief back to me what we just talked about and how you're going to go out and execute so that I have an understanding of what I need to do to support you. Mm -hmm. So now you one, you're taking ownership is about you being able to better communicate and you're showing your people that you care about them and that you're intently working on your communication. You also just set new standards. So when you get done with a brief for a meeting, (coughs) there are no excuses for your people not to be, not to know that you weren't going to call them out. So when you call them out, to, or not calling them out, but when you call on them to brief back you what the plan was, they don't feel like they're being called out. Right. You don't want to do that. I don't. If you work for me, I don't want you to feel like I'm calling you out. I, I never want that. I want to make sure that we have alignment, we have a great relationship, and you know that I want you to win. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. Now, I give you the plan. You brief it back to me. And then now you have to go create your plan based off of that. You're coming up with your plan. And if you come up to me and you say, hey, JP, I don't I don't know what I should be doing. I'm like, all right, well, what are some of the issues that are causing, you know, um, confusion? What, what was I not clear about in my brief? What, what do I need to do to help you? Again, I'm putting it back on me. It's about my communication to you. Because if you work for me and you can't come up with a plan based off of the information I gave you, that means that my communication was too confusing or I didn't train you properly. So I'm using this time of communication with you to figure out what it is. Either is my communication wrong or are you not adequately trained right. in how to get the job done? And then yeah. I'm just going to go down that path from there. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And then part of it also might be you just being timid to come up with a plan because you don't want it to be wrong. And so part oh, of it might, hundred percent, and we know that so that's a big thing with a lot of people. Yeah. So if that's the case, I'm going to, again, ask questions I'm, and I'm going to say, Hey, Lucas, you know, based off of these parameters, what do you think we should do? And if you push back, back, I don't know, man, whatever you want me to do, boss. No, no, no. Lucas, like, what are you, what, like, what do you think works? You're smart. You, I mean, you're a hard worker. You understand what we do here. Correct. And you're going to be like, well, yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, well, based off of what we do, and your skill set, what do you want to do? How do you want us to accomplish this? What makes sense to you? And again, if you push back again, be like, I don't know. It, it, I, I just don't know enough. Okay, well, what part of this do you not know enough about? Like, what what do I need to take the time to to educate you more on so that you can make decisions? Because if you don't know enough about what we do as an organization, that's on me, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And then I might just ask you, depending on my relationship, if I have a good relationship with you, I might say, hey, Lucas, are you just not wanting to come up with a plan because you don't want it to get it wrong? Because if you feel that way, that's on me. And I'm sorry I've made you feel that way. If you come up with the wrong plan, that's my responsibility. And I'm okay with us working through you coming up with the wrong plans as long as we're looking to grow and develop your skill set. You're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. You're going to make all the same mistakes that I made. So with that being said, what plan do you want us to work on? Like, what do you think we should do? And I'm going to take as much of what you give me and implement, if not all of it. Now, if there's some things that are dangerous and or going to get our people hurt, I'm going to use that as a time of education. Say, hey, I like all of these things. Hey, man, remember, the one thing that we can't do is we can't do this because of our limitations legally. And also, we want to make sure we keep our people safe. That's why we can't do this. Everything else, great ideas. I really like this. Let's implement your plan. I'm going to keep pushing it back to you. So then I, then what percentage of right does my plan need to be? Right? Because as a leader, like when you make, when you give. 70 to 80%. Okay. That's, that's what I'm looking for. 
right? Is that like, all right. Because so, things are, and, and sorry, let me yeah, interrupt yeah, yeah. you. Here's why. I feel like you're going to answer my question, so go for it. Have you ever created a perfect plan ever in your life? Probably. <laughs> No, there's no way. Okay, right? so we, yeah, there's we no know way. nobody has ever created a perfect plan that yeah. once they started executing from A to Z, everything went in place. We know that. Yeah, no, nobody. It's never that. happened on mm-hmm. anything, anything in life. So, with that being said, we know we've had to make modifications and adjustments to our plans. Okay. If I focus on this, Part of being mentally tough means thinking for yourself, meaning I'm giving my team resilience. I'm giving them courage. I'm making them mentally tough by saying, hey, what do you think? I'm helping them get over being afraid. They're afraid and they're scared to make a plan because they, they're, they're afraid of what people are going to think about them. Right. When you're mentally tough, you re- you don't care about what other people think. You do the right things for the right reasons. You put in the work. You put in the repetition. You do what you're supposed to do. It doesn't matter what people say. They're like, oh, you're working out too much. Okay, cool. Yep. Oh, you're doing all that meal prep stuff. Oh, blah, blah, blah. oh you don't drink alcohol anymore. Yeah, no, I don't. Oh, you don't do drugs. No, I don't. I, I don't care. Well, you're going to make fun of me for not drinking alcohol? Yep. I mean, people are. No, and people will. Yeah. I don't care. If you're that much of a loser that you want to make fun of me for being sober, if you want to compare lifestyles, I'm willing to bet if you were to compare, mine probably looks a little bit better than the people that make fun of me for not drinking. Yeah. Because here's the deal. I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that is super successful in life. And I'm not saying I'm super successful. Sure. I'm not. Not not even far. I'm not. But it depends on, again, going back to how we measure success. 100%. And I right. knew you were going to say that, but yeah. I'm just saying the general realm right. of super success, not even close, like yeah. not even knocking. I'm not even in that neighborhood, which right. I'm fine with. I will be one day. Yeah. But where I'm at, I love. I'm very thankful for what God has given yeah, you're me. You're in a nice so neighborhood. let me be very clear. Yeah. What God has given me, I am super thankful for. Right. Extremely thankful for. But all the people that I would rank way higher than me in regards to like just success in regards to just life, right? Just life, yeah. not financially, but life, not one of those people would ever make fun of me for not drinking anymore. Not one of them. I'm telling you, there's not one of those people that'd be like, you're a loser for not drinking anymore. What, you're not going to drink? And I guarantee you not one of them, if they offered me a drink, if I was oh, yeah, hey, actually, I... I I'm good. I appreciate it, man. It's man. It's been almost 400 days since I've had alcohol. Not one of them would be like, come on, man. Just one drink. Yeah. Why won't you drink with me? You know what everybody would say? Good for you. That's awesome. Good for yeah. you. Wow. Really? What made you do that? I've been thinking about not drinking also. Yeah. I'm telling you like those are. Yeah. Or they would give you the. Okay. So do you mind if I have one? Right? Yeah. Like if they, it, if oh, yeah, person, yeah. Oh, like that's the response. Well, hey, do you hey. care if I have a drink? I'd be like, bro, you could have 12. Yeah. I'll drive you home. Yeah. <laughs> like, I you don't know? care what you do. Right. Um, and so, like, that's the other thing you have to think about. Mentally tough people, they're not worried about what other people are thinking. I've, I've, it goes back to your whole, if you want to be a bold, strong Christian, you think I care about what anybody thinks in regards to my faith anymore? No. No. I think we've been pretty bold with that on this podcast. Yep. Pretty bold with it on the Jesus and Jiu Jitsu podcast that I'm a part of, the yeah, Jesus maybe. and Jiu Jitsu ministry that I'm a part of. Oh, and then also getting on Jocko's podcast that has about 7 million downloads per episode and reading out of the Bible with him. You seem comfortable with it at this stage <laughs> in your life. <laughs> yeah. You know what's sad? I haven't always been like that. And neither have I. And like, even as a minister, neither have I. Okay. And that's, uh, I think that's one of those things that we all. That's really comforting for people to hear, by the way. Well, it's, so thank you for sharing it's that. It's one of those things that I think as individuals, any decision that we make that is personal, that there is a certain amount of discomfort that is built into it because mm. there was a discomfort that caused us to make a personal decision, Right. If it has to do with with working out, if it has to do with being disciplined, if it's got to do with the things that are on, you know, the the seventy five hard list, if it's got to do with you know drinking a gallon of water or take, I have one issue with the list on seventy five hard. The reason that I haven't done it yet is there's one thing I can't wrap oh, I my know. head around. I already what, know what, what it do you is. know what it, what do you think it is? Taking the picture daily. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You know right? why? Be- but you know why that's on the list? No. Because you don't want to do that. But and, for sure I don't. And you know why? Most humans don't want to do that. But here's the thing. Does he say you have to post it? 
No. Okay. But I don't even want it. I don't, I don't want it to exist. But he's also wants you to do it so that you get used to doing the small things. Right. And and this is something like at anything else on this list, I'm totally fine with. Yeah. Right. Well, I won't say anything else that's on this list is something that I have done. And a lot of these things outside of drinking a gallon of water, which a lot of these things are like pretty natural for me to oh, do. Yeah. Okay. Right? So taking a picture of myself every day, piss off. Well, <laughs> like that's, that's my immediate yeah, reaction. But you, you'll get over it when we all do 75 hard together. I, I might do. Nope. There one, is no modification. No, no, that's what I'm saying. I might do day one of 75 hard <laughs> for the entire 75 days that you guys do it because I'll refuse to take the picture. But that's, that's one of those things that in when you're, we're looking at like the big personal decisions that we make, they all come with a certain amount of discomfort and that discomfort of that insecurity perpetuates this uh, sort of, uh, I want to say it's not necessarily shame, mm -hmm. but this shyness in talking about it. And particularly like when we move into a new position, like when I became the pastor of a church and I'm still working out with the same guys. I'm still hanging out with a bunch of my friends who are musicians. And I know, and, and the guys from the Harley shop, I know as soon as I added pastor to my name, and as soon as I added that title onto something, that they viewed me differently. And there was part of me that wanted to be like, no, I'm the same guy. But the truth of the matter is my responsibilities changed immensely. Mm -hmm. And if I am trying to say, no, I'm the same guy, like, don't worry about it. Like, everything's cool. Like, I'm, I'm still Lucas. Then I'm setting a terrible example for all the people that are looking up to me. Yeah. And, and that was where, that was my big wake up call. It's okay like, for not being the same person. Yeah. Th if, th that's, if, a, if, that's a great thing. If, if. You're not the same person in a positive manner growing sure. with your relationship towards Christ. Yeah. Now there's other ways. Yeah, there's yeah. other ways that that can go. But like that, that's the whole thing. If what I'm pleading, if my my plea with people that are judging me for a decision that I've made or a change that I've made in my lifestyle is, hey, don't worry, I'm the same person. I'm the same person. Then what we need to do is we need to evaluate whether or not we really sincerely made that change. Because if I became a Christian and I'm pleading with everybody, hey, don't worry, I'm the same person. Did I really make a sincere change in my life? If I am looking at my lifestyle differently or I've stopped drinking or those kind of things and I'm pleading with people that I'm the same person, I need to evaluate whether or not those lifestyle changes were sincere enough changes that I'm, I'm secure with that and moving forward. Yeah. Speaking of the security bit, I, I think there is this phenomena that I'm, I'm struggling to deal with when it comes to mentally tough people because I think that there is this idea that mental toughness is directly related to not caring about what people think. And I think that when, when somebody, the, the old like thou dost protest too much kind of thing, like if you want to go on a 10 minute rant, about how much you don't care about what people think, right? Yeah. What have you just revealed about yourself? That, that, that is probably the thing you think about the most mm -hmm. is, is what people think. How do you coach people to who their ego has told them that they're mentally tough, that they have set up this barrier and this wall of like, I don't care what people think and nobody's going to blah, blah, blah. And they go on this whole, you know, they've got a lot of bravado around that in particular. Well, how do you coach them to actually be mentally tough and recognize, Hey, everything you're saying here is revealing. You've got a pretty big insecurity surrounded around like what people think, even though you're saying the opposite of that. Um, <clears throat> one, you're going to have to evaluate your relationship with that person because if you don't okay. have a good relationship, you can't have this conversation. 100%. Because it's yeah, going to yeah. come off as conflict. We're going to argue. We're going to fight. You're not going to listen to anything I have to say. And so I would have to evaluate my relationship with that person. And if, if I have a really good relationship, then cool. We can, we can dive into uh, the conversation. I'm going to ask you questions, and I'm going to do what Jocko did with me. And he's going to listen to me talk, and he's going to say, you know what, JP? What I found talking and working with people is that discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. Because I was frustrated with 
<coughs> some like personal some personal stuff you know yeah. i was fr- frustrated with some personal stuff and i was frustrated with you know my health and some other stuff like that and and that was his answer to me he's like when he's like nobody really enjoys being overweight nobody does nobody enjoys being overweight they just lie to themselves and say they don't care mm-hmm. in reality they do care yeah but again, discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. So by you saying, oh, I don't really care, you're lying to yourself. And that's why that complacency is rooted in the lies that we allow ourselves to believe. Yep. So if I tell myself these lies and then I believe it, then I'm complacent. Because then I can be like, oh, I don't really care that I'm overweight. It's okay that I'm overweight. You know, hey, I'm, I'm traveling all the time. I'm busy all the time. And hey, I'm in hotels freaking five nights a week and eating, you know. I like, carry it well. That's a one that, that <sighs> I love when people say, yeah. oh, I carry the weight well. I carry it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot to that and again it comes down to just the discipline that we lack and i would just start asking that person questions i say okay well i i understand what you're saying i've actually thought the same thing before but what i realized is that when i was only focused on not caring what people thought it actually ruined the relationships that i had with people because then i wasn't able to find a connection with them. I wasn't able to have empathy for them. I wasn't actually able to listen. And what I've realized is that as I've been trying to grow to be a better human and a better leader, I need to be focused on building really good relationships. I need to have better empathy for people. That means I actually had to listen to them. And so while I don't, I don't get sucked into what they think about me, I actually do care about what they think. And I take it on board as their perspective. And I, I evaluate it and I find the truths in what they have to say. And and I just evaluate if it's applicable to what I have going on in my life. For example, Lucas, I might have, you know, a family member who has their opinion on, on, you know, how I spend my money. Yeah. And while honestly, I don't truly care big picture about that because I'm financially secure. I have, you know, I'm invested into multiple companies, you know, my family is in a much different position. Mm -hmm. I also have tried to remind myself that they do care about me and that they, what they have to say, there might be some truth in it. Sure. And what I try to do is when, you know, this family member has their opinions, I know that she's coming from a point of genuine concern. That's what I tell myself so that I can have an open mind. And then I'll take what she has to say from the conversation and see what applies to me. And while it might not make a big difference, big picture in what I have going on in my life, some of the things might actually apply. And what I realized is when I would just go into those conversations closed minded, I wouldn't get anything from them. Right. And now I realize that some of the things that she said, I could actually apply in regards to, you know, taxes and being smarter with this and actually that could affect me longer. I'm giving it obviously an yeah, example yeah, yeah. right now. I would have a conversation with somebody to show them why having an open mind in regards to listening to people can be beneficial to the relationship that you have, because I'm focused on the relationship and I want to make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to building relationships. I don't want to, you know, there's a few social media people, I'm not even called them experts on anything, but they they literally have fooled enough people to think that if they just yell at them and insult them about mm-hmm. the things that they do in their life, that those people are mentally tough. And it's like, no, 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 that's the exact opposite. And, you know, it, the, honestly, I think it's a lot of people trying to be like Andy Frisella because he, I mean, he drops some F-bombs and he gets what? pretty intense, but here's the deal. <laughs> The guy who is I, I like, might, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the MF CEO. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing about Andy. You know what I've never heard him do? I've never heard him yell at or insult a person. Yeah. He's talking about people's mental toughness and or the lack of it. He's he's he gets intense and will you know yell at people that are being mentally weak. Not once have I ever heard him insult an actual person. And then there's other idiots out there that are like, well, if you don't have these certain health standards, like if you don't have this, I'm going to fire you. You're an idiot. (laughs) Like you're an absolute moron. Yeah. And, but there are people that like buy into that and they think that's cool because 
of just social media hype and you know yeah, all these I'm being things. hardcore because I did I'm doing X Y and Z yeah yeah like no you're a fraud and you will be exposed soon enough because intent has a smell yeah and you've been putting a lot of clone on it but eventually it's going to run out and the, people uh, are going to see that you're, you're a perfume prince <laughs> yeah <laughs> as a as a one uh, Colonel Hackworth yeah. said in. What, what was it called? Hazardous Duty, I think was the name of that book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. I want to close it out with a few thoughts. And yeah, then yeah. I'll read it out. Um, okay. I love that. So, again, being part of Mentally Tough means thinking for yourself. And that's what I want to go back to. Not the right. whole, I don't care what people think about. Let's focus on the like the big part of what Lucas and I were talking about is thinking for yourself. Think of someone that you admire. This can be anybody, a family member, an athlete. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you think of someone who you admire, someone who is in, in a position in life that you aspire to get to. That's that's key. I like that. Now ask yourself, <clears throat> what do that person's routines look like? Do they work hard every day? Do they build strong relationships? Have they built wealth? Are they someone who continually tries to learn? Are they physically fit and as healthy as they can be given the limitations that life or injuries may have placed upon them? I'm willing to bet that if you admire someone, then you answered yes to most, if not all of the above. Let's just give that a second to think in. You admire them. They have strong routines. They equal their routines. Therefore, you admire their routines. Got it? All right. And then he just goes on to he he talks about the opposite, which is comical when you when you buy the book and you read about the example he gives of a crackhead. <laughs> How you wouldn't want their lifestyle. It's absolutely amazing. Sorry, a crack addict living in the right. streets, right? Would you want their <laughs> so <clears throat> mental toughness is what you do when other people aren't looking. Again, going back to the integrity that we talked about earlier, it's the extra rep, one more chapter and being able to admit when you're wrong, it's grit, it's drive, it's part of your purpose, but above all else, mental toughness is a tool that allows you to win the daily battle against yourself. Again, Lucas and I were talking about the book on mental toughness by my buddy, Andy Frisella, go to Andy Frisella's website to check that out. Thank you all for the support. All of you guys give us by listening, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. It's been awesome to see our YouTube community growing. Would you yeah, agree with fun. that? It's yeah, pretty it's, rad. It's cool, man. <clears throat> if you want to follow us on social media, I am at JP Danell. Lucas is at L U C A S P I N C K A R D. Make sure you're also following what we do at Echelon Front. You can go to echelonfront.com on social media. It's at Echelon Front. Hope to see you guys at a future event or having one of our instructors come work with you. If you want, you can also check out the ministry that I'm a part of called Jesus and Jiu Jitsu on social media. That's Jesus and Jiu Jitsu underscore USA. Uh, part of that ministry with Isaac Tau F is Stephen Little, Josh Strasberger. We also have a podcast that comes out every Tuesday. Yep. And we also do free Jiu Jitsu seminars where somebody shares their testimony and then we open it up to open mat afterwards. We do those about every five to six weeks. <clears throat> I'm also a partner of a Texas beef company called Little Cattle Co. Get that beef. Uh, you follow us on social media at Little Cattle Co. That's our name. Also, our website is littlecattle.co. My best friend, Stephen Little, started that back in 2017. On next week's episode, you'll be able to hear about that. 026. Yeah. My wife and I partnered with them in early 2023. Uh, we can deliver beef anywhere in the lower 48 states. Uh, we are... Uh, like I said, a Texas beef company where our steers are grass fed, grain finished. They're out in pastures, roaming, having an awesome life. We actually ranch them the old school way, the way it's supposed to be on horseback to make sure that those animals are taken care of. They have the, the, the quality of the meat is unlike anything else. You check that out. We also have our ground beef subscription model that's Very up. Cool. That's been amazing. You can get 10, 15, 20 pounds delivered each month on auto ship. And if you pick 10, you get 10% off 15, 15% off 20, you get 20% off. Isaac's got a ground beef subscription. He does. Yeah. He does. Uh, also a partner with my best friend, Josh Strauselberger for a uh, printing company and apparel printing company on the path. You can check us out on Instagram. That's on the path printing. 
I uh, also want to continuously thank Origin and Jocko Fuel for all the support they've given me over the years. What they're doing is absolutely incredible. Uh, I had the honor of having some of their media team shadow me the other week uh, as they're putting together some content for all the new clothes that Origin's coming out with. All their stuff's 100% American made. The products at Jocko Fuel are uh, just incredible, healthy, good products for you. They have healthy, clean energy drinks, no jitters, no crash. Uh, if you want to go to originusa.com or go to jockofuel.com to check out what they have, um, I, it's it's really cool to see what they've been doing and how fast they've been growing. Yeah, man. Um, <clears throat> As we close it out, I just want to remind you that integrity is a is a huge thing. No matter what you have going on in life, trying to maintain that integrity is going to require a lot of discipline, and it's going to require mental toughness. And mental toughness requires discipline and integrity. So if I'm focusing on maintaining integrity, having discipline, and being mentally tough, they're all going to feed each other. And I can tell you right now, the world needs more leaders. It needs better humans. And we need mentally tough people that are willing to go out there and put in the work. With that, this has been the JP Denell Podcast, episode 25.